Secretary Albright, it is wonderful to have you. Thank you for joining us for the Carter Center weekend. I have the benefit of having worked with you starting in 1990 when I was headed off to Czechoslovakia and you kindly made an introduction for me to Michael Jantowski and, and Havel, and that was a wonderful way to start. And then our overlaps in Kosovo were equally as wonderful. So thank you for all of your support over time. And I love your pen. I was trying to decipher exactly what that was. Well, I was very glad to have a peanut pin uh, in order to celebrate President Carter. And I'm so pleased that you are now at the Carter Center and that all the various things you've done have added up in a way where uh, you are the perfect person to really be there at what is a remarkable, remarkable, um, every part of the Carter Center in terms of its memories, the things it does, its outreach, and the things that President Carter continues to do abroad. Well, thank you. It's it's wonderful to be here. I think it's been, to say it's been an unprecedented year is really an understatement. I think, yeah, I voted twice here in Georgia and, you know, elections that were truly consequential in ways that I don't think a very red state would have expected. So it has been an opportunity for us to really see democracy at work. And you were, saw the rock and roll presidency and participated in the making of that uh, movie. And so thank you for all of your comments. But what I loved is you picked up the phone and you wanted to talk to President Carter after that. So tell us a little bit about how that ended up occurring. Well, I have to say, I loved the movie and I was very surprised by all the things because I didn't come into the administration until the second year. Uh, and I hadn't really known President Carter very well before. And so I loved the movie and I obviously loved working for him. But I decided that uh, I, it would be terrific to have a call with him personally. We've done that off and on at various times. And so I requested a call and believe it or not, it was on January 6th. And we were on the phone together, both of us, I think, having been alerted to something going on um, up in, on Capitol Hill. And we're watching this unbelievable scene. Um, and I, I, I have to say, I, I was speechless and, and absolutely appalled. And I thought I must be watching some terrible movie because um, I had been to Capitol Hill an awful lot and obviously been in the chamber many times. And what flashed through my mind because I was on the phone and because I love to think about my time with President Carter, but what flashed through my mind was listening to him give the State of the Union message from the podium with Walter Mondale sitting in the spot where the vice president sits. And it really reminded me of what two remarkable leaders uh, could do, how they worked with Congress, uh, despite uh, all the aspects of executive legislative relations and, and how President Carter in choosing vice Pre Mondale to be vice president helped to create the modern vice presidency. Uh, absolutely. I think that was a period in time that we all look back at uh, as a normalization in how our democracy worked. And so I can imagine on January 6th, you must have been questioning whether or not we were headed down a path. You've written books on this and talking about our concern about populism. But did you think we we're going to be headed in the right direction after this last election? Or did you foresee this as being, you know, just a, a swing of the pendulum? Well, I have to say, and you spoke about having gone to Czechoslovakia, and um, I came to the United States with my family in November 1948. Uh, my father was a Czechoslovak diplomat, and he did not want to work for the communists after the coup in February 1948. And I'll never forget his coming here and saying to us, Americans don't understand how fragile democracy is and how resilient it is. And I will never forget that because um, it is certainly true in terms of the kinds where things we're seeing. I have to tell you, I'm not, I don't think it is just a swing of the pendulum. I think that um, it is a, a new period. It's not gonna go back to where it was. Um, and uh, I think there's no way to kind of think about normalization in this. It is a new period and a challenge to democracy 
for a number of reasons, but the key one, I think, is that there are new weapons uh, to undermine what is the basic breath of democracy and the blood of democracy, which is information and knowing where information comes from and that it's true because you cannot have democracy if the people do not know what is happening. And added to that are a whole group of new weapons that are um, described as cyber, various right. cyber things that people don't understand, but it is, they are very dangerous. And so I think we can't just kind of think, okay, well, we'll sit around and it'll get back to some kind of normalization. We are in a new period. Right. Well, it is, uh, you know, you have lived your life with democracy being the focus, whether you were in exile in London or whether you were in exile again with the communists from Czechoslovakia, you have really lived your life living these, uh, these issues. I know that with the last book that you wrote, uh, Hell and Other Destinations, you talk about your post-Secretary of State life. And I think you and President Carter and Mrs. Carter absolutely share that in your intention to do something new and make every chapter interesting. So I'm curious for, you know, in that mirroring between you and President Carter on this next phase in life, you know, I think you're right. Cybersecurity is a place that we are all going to be suffering, learning as we get older what this new, you know, front line is. So what worries you the most? I assume it's the disinformation and the cybersecurity piece, but are there other elements of our own democracy that we want to move forward in a productive way? Well, I really do think that we have to analyze what is the basis of democracy. Um, right. And it's obviously participation by the people based on information that they have, but also leadership, which recognizes that um, democracy is not easy. Uh, and that it always is a journey uh, and that democracy has to deliver. Uh, and there's always this question as to whether democracy um, is uh, just, uh, you know, talking about democratic ideals or also uh, the economy that people uh, need to be able to have a life. And then I've always said democracy has to deliver because people want to vote and eat. And I have to say that President Carter has been the most inspirational person in all of this in his post-presidential life. It was wonderful to work for him when he was president and his real um, dedication to human rights. But the kinds of things that he's done since are also the element of what has to happen for democracy. People need to be healthy. He has certainly worked on that. And then people need to be able to practice their um, ideas about how to be involved in democracy. And he and Mrs. Carter have worked very hard in terms of doing that. And so I do think what we need are more Jimmy Carters, people who understand how hard democracy is, are devoted to it, and are willing to put their shoulder to the wheel. So I am for more Jimmy Carters. Well, thank you for that. It really, for the next generation to see what you and President Carter have done really sets us on a path and the Carter Center exists because this is what a post-presidency should look like. So thank you for participating with us this weekend. It is wonderful to have you. It's wonderful to have your support. I know President and Mrs. Carter send their best and thank you for all of your efforts, both in the White House and outside of the White House to make this world a better, more democratic place. Well, thank you, Paige, and thank, I'm so grateful that you are there, and please give my love and admiration to the Carters. Absolutely. Thanks so much.